thank you for joining us from across the Commonwealth. In the last year, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that the right to health should not be taken for granted. Across the Commonwealth, many people are unable to access the care and protection they need. Inequality is at unprecedented levels. Young people in wealthy countries wait in line for vaccines, while older people in less affluent nations have hardly begun to queue. What is meant by the right to health? How does it apply when the whole world is swept by disease? And how can it be used to judge the actions of governments and the international community? We have seen extraordinary measures taken by governments to save lives during this pandemic. But the obligation of states extends to addressing people's overall and underlying health and well-being needs, such as protection from poverty and access to safe and dignified work. Should the international community, including our commonwealth, be doing more to defend the right to health? In this conversation to follow, health policy experts, practitioners and advocates from across the Commonwealth will attempt to chart a better path forward through COVID-19 and beyond. Welcome. Welcome. And thank you for joining this critical conversation. Um. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone who has joined us today. Um, I understand there are about 3,000 people who have registered for this event from all across the world, I believe from about 107 countries, so welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Ines Hassan. I am a senior, senior coordinator at the International Science Council, and I'm honoured that the Commonwealth Foundation has asked me to host this critical conversation today. The topic today is of course focused on the right to health uh, in, in the time of crisis and we're going to try and understand what the lessons are learned, what, what lessons we can learn um, from the COVID-19 pandemic specifically. Um, we're really going to try and interrogate um, how the right to health framework itself has stood up against the pandemic and highlight what has worked, where it has worked, when it has worked and of course what hasn't quite gone to plan. The right to health first articulated in the 1946 constitution of the WHO is often, is often associated with an access to healthcare services. Of course, everybody should have access to good quality healthcare um, when and where they need them without suffering financial hardship. Um, but no one, no one should get sick and die just because they're poor or, or they can't access these, these services. But as our panellists will tell us later on today, the right to health actually includes a much wider range of factors um, that help us lead healthy lives, such as safe drinking water, adequate uh, sanitation, safe food access, nutrition, uh, housing, health, working, environmental conditions and gender and racial equality and, and so much more. So these ideas, of course, are not new. Um, at the turn of the century, the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights published a statement on the right to health, which also mentions the right to freedom, such as the right to be free from non-consensual medical treatment and the rights to entitlements, the entitlement to a health system that allows equal non-discriminatory access to healthcare, um, where services should respect medical ethics, they should be gen gender sensitive, culturally appropriate, uh, and, and of course, scientifically backed. Um, also, it states that populations should be involved in health related decision making at national and community levels. Of course, based on this, you know, ideal definition, uh, we as a global community have a long way to go before we can deliver on, on these requirements in actually any country across the world. Um, what has been really clear uh, throughout uh, this pandemic is that the outcomes um, of COVID-19 has been severely exacerbated by human rights failures. We've seen marginalised and disadvantaged populations in nearly all countries across the world who have higher rates of morbidity and mortality from COVID-19. Um, and these risks and, uh, underscore the imperative for a more coordinated human rights based uh, response to the pandemic and, and to other um, uh, health emergencies. Um, and especially so that it protects health by realising those rights and prioritising those who are, of course, most vulnerable. Another really well publicised issue 
it is in vaccine equity, vaccine accessibility, which has been uh, talked about all across the world. Interestingly, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights lays out um, obligations for international assistance and cooperation. And this is widely understood to include equitable, equitable goals for vaccine distribution today. Uh, I looked at the Our World uh, in Data website uh, just this morning, and as of today, only 0.8% of all the people in Africa have received a single dose of the COVID-19 vac vac vaccine, or one of the many vaccines, um, compared to 27% in North America and 20% in Europe. So we, of course, have a very, very long, long way to go. Anyway, enough from me. You've, here, you've come here to hear um, from our experts. And so I would now like to warmly welcome our esteemed panel today. Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tlaleng Mofakeng, um, who is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Welcome, Tlaleng. I'd also like to welcome Mr. Alan Meleche, uh, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a human rights defender. Uh, Sadly, Alan will only be joining us for the first hour today, so we'll hopefully try and get as many of his thoughts as possible um, in that first hour. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Arna Amaya, um, an assistant professor at Pace University, and Dr. Uh, Githinji uh, Gitahi, um, the CEO of AMREF Health uh, in Africa. So welcome to all of you. Um, before we get started, I was told that I need to let the audience know that questions are welcome at, at any time via the Q&A function. You should be able to have access to that. Uh, and if possible, and you feel uh, comfortable, please state your name uh, and country when submitting questions. Um, and if we don't answer all your questions, I've been assured that we're going to be developing some of those uh, common questions in, in the blogs. And so please watch out for those on the Commonwealth um, Foundation website. Okay, fantastic. So I think we should start off um, by maybe getting some thoughts from the experts on uh, what you understand, uh, what, what do you understand by the term a right to health? So let me turn first to Tlaleng. Um, how would you define the rights to health? I think you're on mute. There we go. Thank you so much um, for the invitation and good day to the colleagues and all of the participants. Um, for me, I think it's a simple one. Um, I draw, of course, my work and my mandate um, from the Office of the High Commissioner, but specifically from the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and also um, in general comment number 14, which further defines mostly obligations, right, that state parties have to fulfill um, in order to implement the right to health at the national level. But we know that the right to health um, is interrelated and interconnected um, to other rights and it's an inclusive right. Um, and it extends not only to the idea of people getting access to health services, uh, more appropriate health care, but also encompasses and, in, and, and also includes underlying determinants of health, such as adequate supply of safe food, nutrition and housing, access to safe and portable and adequate sanitation, healthy occupational and environmental conditions. And I think even more importantly for someone like myself who comes into the mandate from a sexual and productive health rights background, the right to health includes access to health related information and education including on sexual and reproductive health. And I think that's for me is really um, the main broad definition of the right to physical and mental health. And of course it is a broad concept that can be broken down into more specific entitlements such as maternal, child and reproductive health, informed consent, bodily integrity and freedom from torture, ill treatment and health move harmful practices, as well as entitlements to healthy natural and workplace environments, and the prevention and treatment and control of diseases include access to essential medicines, which I think is what brings us today. It's this idea that the right to health, as much as it is about accessing health, we know that there should be a lot more being done by states on a national level um, to prevent, to treat and control disease. And in this instance, COVID-19, 
as well as including access to essential medicine, which the vaccine has been determined and referred to as such. And so it's very important for me um, to locate the discussions within those definitions, again, given to us by the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights. Thank you. Thank you, Tsaleng. Um, Gitenji, uh, I was wondering if I could ask you also for your thoughts on, on the definition of uh, the right to health. And I think um, it'd be interesting because sometimes these terms and these, these definitions, they're so broad, you know, that, um, you know, they're, they're almost unattainable in some ways, um, some people may say. And also, like, for example, we've seen statements from so many different organisations, from governments, from kind of regional groups who've all talked about the importance of right to health, you know, in the, in the pandemic specifically. Um, and later on, we'll talk about some of the issues as, as, as to why we haven't seen that um, framework necessarily be, uh, being resilient. Um, so I just wanted to know, like, uh, any thoughts on the definition itself? And also, um, you know, is, do you think the definition well, well understood? Oh, thank you, Ines, and uh, uh, glad to be here. Glad to see my colleagues here. Uh, well, I, I tend to think that the right to health is a desire. Is that thing that we dream about but are unable to achieve? That's the way I look at it. And I look at it that way because number one is that it is, we say, and I'm, you know, exactly what um, Laleng has said, it is that need for everyone to have the minimum standard of health they need for them to have a good life. That's basically, you know, to have well being. And uh, this whole concept around the fact that you have a right to access the prevention or promotion or curative care or, rehab or whatever it is, or the entire spectrum of health that you deserve to actually give you an attainable standard of physical and mental well being. That is the definition uh, that we work with. But when you look at where we are, the right to health is seen as something that. Um, it's a desire. It's not something that we want to achieve. And that's actually the disaster of all this. And I think that's what has probably precipitated some of this conversation. Now, um, the right to health, if you look at the global situation right now, you'd ask yourself, who is the right holder? It is all of us. It's every individual that is extremely clear. Every individual, irrespective of who you are, your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion, whether you live in a, um, uh, you know, in a conflict state or not, whatever, all of us, it's all of us are rights holders. But the question is, who is the duty bearer in this framework? And that's really where the issue is. The interrelationship between the right holder and the duty bearer is where we have failed humanity. I actually tend to think that the right to health in us is the most fundamental human right without which none of the other rights we provide to people can be enjoyed. If I give you the right to political and civil um, right and uh, the right to assemble and the right to choose, the right to do this and that, or the right to education indeed, but you have no health, how can you exercise any of those rights? So the most fundamental human right is the right to health. And yet it is the one that actually we have not put a framework in which uh, it needs to be achieved or in which it can be attainable. And I think this has a long history. This is a long history, um, you know, all the way to the conversations around the, uh, the Declaration on Human Rights and the right to health being seen as something progressive, something the right, the duty, the duty bearers can get away with. You know, if you see, if a country starts to shoot dead its people, it's no longer only the country which is responsible. The international community mobilizes itself and moves in to protect the people. But how come when we talk about the right to health, it is seen as a country can say we can't afford to provide adequate maternal health. Therefore, it's okay. When we, uh, we can afford it, we will provide it. This progressive visit and this kind of second generation look at right to health is really our biggest problem. So I would like to stop there because I know we have a lot of conversation. But I think it's that right that the most fundamental that actually the world has failed to provide for the right holders, for the right bearers, the right holders, sorry, yeah. 
Absolutely. And, and it's interesting because today we're talking about the right to health you know, in a global emergency, but it's very clear, you know, that we failed to deliver on the right to health mandate, you know, you know, in peacetime as well anyway. Um, so which, which is another conversation I think that, that needs to be had uh, and, and to understand kind of why. But I want to take us to the, our first um, theme um, that we'd like to discuss with all of you today. And, and the first theme is the right to health in a global emergency. And um, like I said, so I don't know. If First of all, I'd like to explore um, how, why and how accountability and transparency um, is important uh, to, the, to achieving, um, uh, to delivering the right to health in a global uh, emergency. And perhaps some examples of kind of where we have seen um, that being done well, <laughs> and some examples of where we haven't, uh, um, that hasn't been done well. And if I may, I will go to Alan, uh, first of all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Inez, and uh, greetings to all my colleagues and those who have found time to join this uh, conversation. Indeed, my colleagues have accurately highlighted the concept of the right to health. And I think in the context of a pandemic, uh, we then want to look at the right to health in terms of not only addressing the pandemic, but ensuring people are getting the rest of the health services. Now, looking at it at that lens and my always appreciation of the right to health stems from uh, a famous principle called the AAA, AAA Q principle of are health services available, are they accessible, are they acceptable, and they are, are they of good quality? And there are measures that help you guide to be able to look into that. And so our experience within the pandemic is that uh, the right to health actually did get violated in the sense that we shifted our focus on dealing with COVID and turned an eye away from other ailments that people had been treated for or other health services that people need. For instance, vaccination for children, women needing to attend uh, reproductive health uh, clinics and get reproductive health care services, uh, people with non-communicable uh, diseases that require uh, attention, were not able to access some of those services because the message that came with the pandemic was stay at home, keep social distance, uh, put on your mask and uh, avoid uh, crowding in places. And so from that point on, it came later to be realized that we need to address the other health sectors because you're gonna start losing the gains on all the children you vaccinated on all the ladies who are delivering safely in hospitals. And so the importance of transparency and accountability came into play in terms of how much information was being made available to citizens around, why do I have to stay home? Why do I have to social distance? Why do I have to wear a mask? What kind of support Dr. Taleng talked about the underlying determinants of health, water, food, education, sanitation, good housing, how is that coming into play in a context of COVID where now you don't have clean and running water in many parts of many countries, you don't have good housing, you don't have good sanitation, but those are the things you're actually being told you have to comply with, but yet they are not readily available for you to be able to comply with them. And so that again, made it extremely difficult for people to adhere. Then there was the whole aspect around the resources received by our governments, either from donor governments or from well-wishers, how well were they being used? If we said we bought testing kits, did we know how many healthcare workers we've tested? Did we know how many uh, vulnerable groups we've tested? Did anyone, were they transparent enough to be able to account in terms of how they've been able to use those resources? And unfortunately, in certain jurisdictions, we have witnessed situations where resources have not been accounted for and largely they have not reached to the end users. And we all know the difficulty of corruption in health is that the most vulnerable are the ones who end up suffering because at the end of the day, it's someone not getting their vaccine, it's someone not getting their COVID test. But even most importantly for countries that rely on donor funding, a number of which are in the Commonwealth, people lose trust in the public health system, especially the procurement one of the supply chain such that if you're a fund and you want to put money in a supply chain in a country, but you're seeing money getting lost, you sort of have fears and you pull back and that pulling back then 
causes a lot of uncertainty. So transparency, accountability remains extremely key when you're dealing with the right to health. And I think I'll just conclude by saying, by having COVID, I think, not that I think, but the experience have been, we have seen an increase in gender-based violence. We have seen an increase in uh, femicide. Uh, we have seen an increase in early childhood pregnancies. And so there are certain unintended consequences that have come along with the COVID pandemic that are going to be detrimental to the health sector. And we have to think not post COVID, but immediately how we're going to rectify that because we can't sit back and say, let's wait for COVID to end, then we'll address this. We have to get into a mode of thinking how are we going to get our children back on vaccination? How are we going to deal with the gender-based violence cases that have begun rising? How are we going to deal with convincing people to continue taking their armies? And that's where transparency, accountability, and providing information to citizens would be extremely key. Thank you, Alan. Um, Anna, I'd like to bring you in here as well. And, and I'd like you, if, if possible, for you to give us some examples of where um, civic freedoms have perhaps been compromised um, uh, throughout the pandemic um, and kind of and perhaps also commentary on kind of where that might you might feel that has been necessary in some aspects, you know, to control, be able to control um, the virus. Um, but yeah, some examples on, on civic freedoms and, and uh, how that's been an issue throughout the pandemic. Thanks so much, Ines, and wonderful to be here with this wonderful panel. Um, I just want to pick up on the previous question a little bit as well, um, picking up on what everyone else has said and the definition of health as a human right. I think underlying all of this is really the obligation of states to ensure this timely, affordable, and accessible access to services. And this is really underlined by prioritizing those who are left behind and ensuring more equitable access to these services. And what we've seen in COVID-19 is that vulnerability is unevenly distributed, right, around the world, but also within countries. It's really uncovered these structural vulnerabilities that we need to address not only directly, but also intersectionally. And we saw that the people who were more disproportionately hurt by the virus have the least control over, or say, in the system. And the reality is that these issues didn't happen overnight. They have been the result of long-term political failures throughout the world that really just came to the surface in this unprecedented time. And so what we saw, as you have hinted to us, is that some governments really took advantage of these uncertainties and the lack of preparedness and uh, this new scenario of a pandemic, which led to the violation of a number of different types of human rights um, more widely. And we still see that today. Um, we've seen um, uh, limitations on um, access to not only services, but also the ability to um, have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, of course, and obviously the, the balance that has to be struck at this moment had been number one, making sure that we have these public health measures in place, but at the other, at the other side, also making sure that we're allowing people to access these rights that they have. And so this is where it becomes tricky um, in terms of ensuring these fundamental rights but also making sure that we are controlling a disease that in the beginning we didn't understand. But at this time, we understand the disease much more and these violations continue to happen. Obviously, um, there are a number of different examples. Uh, my country, El Salvador, there's a lack of transparency still in terms of data, in terms of cases. And in many countries, there's still not access to really what are the number of cases what is the government doing? Um, Alan uh, mentioned a little bit uh, the lack of accountability and lack of corruption and, and the situation of corruption that we find ourselves in. And what's important to note is that corruption doesn't just happen in low-income countries. We've seen cases of corruption in terms of procurement. Also in high-income countries, there are some studies done currently in the European Union. But what this really reminds us is that um, to realize the right to health, we really require meaningful participation, not only from national level stakeholders, but also international stakeholders who can really have this 
overview of what is happening in other countries. It requires a degree of solidarity as well. And this is where I think um, the Commonwealth Fund is really interesting because it really brings together these civil society groups that can really make an impact on ensuring these rights. I wanted to just follow up, and this is a question for any kind of member of the panel, but so we talk about um, uh, state involvement uh, in, in uh, kind of in, in our health as the states have never been so involved, you know, in our, in our health as they have been throughout this pandemic, you know, and so in some ways you can say that it's good that the state has been involved because everybody has a right to health. So they're providing more access. We've, you know, even though it's inadequate in many cases, they're providing as much support when we're homesick or isolating, never you know, in unprecedented ways. So in that way, you can say it's good um, and then in other ways it's also infringing on our human rights you know restricting our right, rights to movement there um you know uh, have, having access to what we're doing where we're based and so i don't know if anybody would like to comment on you know that balance of state involvement and, and infringing on rights but also helping right our rights through uh, through health and alan you look like you want to come i think I'll, I'll give that a try because it's true, we all as human beings have human rights and we come from different countries and our constitutions give our different rights. And I must also admit that rights can be limited except for certain specific rights that are spelled out in the constitution that cannot be limited. And I think the challenge that came with COVID is that that limitation was not well explained for people to be able to understand why then is this right being limited? Why am I not being allowed to have the freedom of association? Why is my freedom of movement not being uh, allowed at this point of time? And I think the challenge I saw and I experienced with many people is that people never made at the early stages the connection around why then do I lose my ability to be able to freely go to a social gathering, to freely go to a wedding, because of the context of the pandemic. And I think in many jurisdictions in the Commonwealth, again, the limitation of rights based on the constitutions they have is normally supposed to be done by parliament. But in our many jurisdictions, this was mostly done by the executive, giving executive directives that either could not be challenged in a court, some have been, but mostly it came from directives from the executive. Yet the COVID-19 pandemic did not mean we're in a state of emergency. So the rules, regulations, and human rights were not suspended. But because of the urgency many executive had to try and put enforcements into place, say, stopping flights from coming in, ensuring people quarantine, there was a bit of zeal there. And I think that's where the tension came with a number of people who strongly believe in human rights. So I think going forward, and I think a good example to borrow from New Zealand is around, how do you try to ensure that communication is very clear? Because also one of the challenges that came with the lockdowns, sometimes it was not definite for how long, for what period, and what is the achievement that is coming. So for instance, it was not clear to certain citizens in certain countries, including my own, in terms of how long are we locked down for and what is our target for this lockdown? Are we looking to test a million people to know where we are with the pandemic? Are we looking to vaccinate a million people to help us know how we are moving? The common line is that we are flattening the curve. But again, for many local citizens, that becomes a challenge because when you're locked down and you don't have access to your daily resources, your daily food, your daily wages, it then becomes difficult. So I think the rights can be limited, but I think the challenge we have seen across a number of Commonwealth countries and other countries broadly is that the man of limiting that those rights did not largely follow the law or were not done well in a way that citizens could be able to understand why those rights are limited. And in certain cases, it was quite brutal, especially where a number of jurisdictions did allow use of police and the use of uh, uh, force in terms of enforcing public health measures, which again, as we know, as healthcare people, it's very counterproductive when you're taking public health measures that require people to be persuaded and convinced on why they need to follow a process. And then you choose to take a more utilitarian approach that really does discourage people. Over to you, Ines. Thank you very much, Alan. I think we're gonna to go to some questions from the audience now. So I'm gonna be looking on my other screen <laughs> to read those questions. 
Um, and so the first question we've had from an audience member is, how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic will impact approaches to the right to health in the future? Will we continue to see wider political public engagement with the issue of health in terms of access? And I'd like to take give that question firstly to Kitenji, if possible. Kitenji. Well, I think uh, what Alan has captured is quite a, a heavy part of, of this conversation. And I think what, what COVID-19 has done is demonstrated how relevant um, the investments in human capital through resilience of health systems is important as a protector of social and economic well-being of people. And I hope and I believe that that demonstration of this pandemic, that protecting the health system is protecting well-being of people, protecting economies, and protecting social cohesion as such. We have also seen, you know, as Alan was saying, and I'm sure there's experienced many places where we have actually seen social unrest arising and actually threatening democracies because of the fact that the health system is not held in together. I think I'm, I'm watching India very closely and you can see what's going on. It's not only a health crisis, it's actually a political crisis. It is a, uh, you know, it's a economic and social crisis. So the question that you're asking is, are we going to learn and are we going to change our approach to putting people and human capital at the center of our investments, at the center of our planning, so that we can protect uh, economies and protect uh, communities and protect our political uh, systems? I think to a great extent, many governments will learn and some will not learn. And I think the ones that will learn are the ones that are going to engage the community more Part of the challenge that you've seen with the piece of human rights has been the directional declaration that you've seen where actually because health is a human right and even movement is a human right and uh, you know assembly is a human right there needs to be engagement of the of the of, of those um rights bearers to know exactly what's going on and the government that will do better are the ones that will learn from this and involve the communities in future policy making, including bringing women on the table. We had challenges uh, in as well. And even now, you know, it, it's, it's surprising that government did their first lockdown or partial lockdown. And we saw women delivering at home because they thought it was unsafe to go to the yeah. hospital beyond curfew because they were going to be beaten up by the police. And we raised those issues. But when the next lockdown happened, there was still no mention of this issue of saying we are putting a lockdown, but we want to ensure safe passage of uh, women who are pregnant and they're in labor and they need to go to the facility. So governments are not learning. And I think that's the biggest frustration. So on one side, those that learn will do better. And those that don't learn will actually get worse because what this pandemic has done in is also is increase the trust gap between the communities and the people. And that also makes it very difficult to actually provide people their rights when there is no trust. Massive. I completely agree. And I can't tell you, I've been interviewing many experts on the pandemic recently, and the number of times people have said governments just don't learn. Uh, I can't even tell you. It's slightly worrying, <laughs> worrying for us all. Um, we've got a second question. I, I could ask you more questions about that. But we'll go to the audience questions first. Um, second question is, how can people with health insurance, uh, without health insurance, sorry, and who are not financially stable, access healthcare in times of crisis like COVID-19? And that comes from Adaura um, Anichi uh, from Nigeria. And I'd like to give that question to Tlaleng. Thank you. Um, this is a very important one because many countries around the world are talking about you know, universal health coverage. They are talking about some form of national health insurance. And we've seen it how in the UK um, it has worked or hasn't worked in certain um, instances. But I think broadly, this is about a question of access and that um, money and financial means gives you access over others. And that is not equality, that's not equity. Um, and as much as in many countries, in many areas around the world, um, and in some of the Commonwealth countries, um, equality and anti-discrimination laws have been enacted and implemented, um, but equality still remains out of reach for many. And that goes beyond just a class issue. It also it is a gendered issue. It's also an issue that affects migrant people who in some countries require to prove um, documentation or proof of address before they can access health services. This is an issue again that intersects with issues of 
sexual orientation and gender identity, um, issues of where you are geographically located, whether you are in a peri-urban or urban center, because it doesn't matter at the end of the day if you have some form of medical insurance. If you are in a rural area that has no road and no electricity and no potable water, that, that health insurance won't yield the desired results because you are far removed from the health um, facilities. And so I think for me, the, the way to go forward is to, is to really look at substantive equality as a goal for all nations and for all of the Commonwealth nations. Um, and this allows us to approach inequality as a problem of structural power and not individual brilliance or class affordability, but a structural power which creates and perpetuates systems of privilege and disadvantage in society. So that's why when we talk about national health insurance, we need to be very clear about who those it leaves behind. Because if we just carry on without questioning the very reason why we are in the space of inequality, we are mm. just going to perpetuate that in the solutions that we come with, right? And because these structural systems and oppressions are perversive in both public and private life, they do affect, of course, the determinants of health, but also distribution of basic goods. It leads to exclusion, and, and again, perpetuates negative myths and harmful stereotypes, which operates to disadvantage certain groups of people, like I've mentioned before. So it's about how do we intentionally use intersectionality in how we think about discrimination within laws, policies, and practices in each of our different regions and countries, and see how those in themselves, the law can be a tool of oppression, and I come from South Africa, so I know this firsthand from colonialism, from apartheid, and now where we are. So I know how laws and policies and practice can be used as models of discrimination. And so we need to look at every single layer of that issue. And again, go back um, to what the states are obligated to do in terms of um, their fulfillment on, on the right to health. It's that they have to give sufficient recognition to the right to health in national, political, and legal systems in a form of legislative implementation, adoption of a national health policy and a detailed plan. And that's where most people fail. It's in the planning and it's in the resourcing. And so for us to have equity across the board, it has to be laid and the fulfillment is, lies in the hands of the governments and the states and not on individual capacity to pay for services. I think we could spend, uh, you know, many hours discussing that in more detail. I'm afraid we have to move on um, to to our next theme, uh, which is a subject which is um, very close to my heart, and that's um, the obligation of the uh, international corporate uh, cooperation. Um, so, what's the obligation of the international community? What obligation do countries have? Um, to one another uh, in times like this, you know, uh, and also I'd love to hear some examples of where cooperation um, has succeeded, where, where they've gone well, and also some, some of, I think, some very obvious examples of where they've, where they've fallen short. Um, so I'm going to go back to Anna to, to give us some thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you, Ines, and I, I think this lends well to what um, my previous panelists were talking about the obligation of states to ensure the right to health, but also the long neglect that states have given to health issues. Um, this, uh, we, we've known for a long time, the importance of health for um, people's lives, but yet we have for a long time seen this distinction between economic issues, um, security issues, which are very much front in the agenda and the political agenda, and social um, issues such as health being very much relegated. And so um, obviously the pandemic brings more to the forefront how these are all interrelated, the effects of um, health issues like pandemics on not only security economics, which um, should be uh, driver for governments to begin to invest more in health issues, if not because it is their responsibility and also it is um, uh, not only the responsibility, but also this issue of solidarity that you're also bringing up between countries. 
And so what we've seen is that there have been really good success uh, cases of countries cooperating together uh, for health issues. This is an area that I've studied quite um, extensively because I'm interested in seeing how collective action can really work for health, especially within regions and within countries that have a lot in common. And I think the strength of the Commonwealth countries is really in its diversity. You have members from different continents who bring very specific things to the table. And the importance is really building on those strengths and getting to tangible actions. And so I've seen, obviously you have um, the, the health ministers meetings and the meetings before World Health Assembly, but also how can these groupings of countries also collaborate with other groupings of countries. We've seen great success from the African Union, obviously with COVID-19 and being able to access vaccines. We also know that several of the Commonwealth countries have the ability to produce medicines and vaccines, so really making the most of that capacity. Um, and obviously uh, bringing to the forefront the importance of health, if not for solidarity and for mutual support and learning, but because it can become a huge catastrophe as, as we've seen with the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I wonder if, Ketenji, you could give us some uh, an example of where things have not worked well. And I'd, I'd be interested actually to hear from um, if some, an example in, in Africa, for example, um, where has perhaps cooperation fallen short? And I've been told um, by the organisers that I need to shorten the answers. So can you please stick to two to three minutes per answer? I know it's not easy. I find it difficult to do as well. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think uh, the, the very brief answer to your question, if I was to summarize in two seconds, is East Africa and Tanzania. That has been a really difficult scenario. And the scenario has been where we have a common framework for international health regulations, international reporting, international border management, disease surveillance. And where one country says, I don't recognize that that disease exists, when there's actually a framework for you know, public health um, emergency of uh, international concern. So that is one great example uh, that actually really struggled, the countries really struggled with. Uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that there are many other areas of, um, of success. You know, the Africa Union um, agenda on having a common continental um, response to COVID-19 and the involvement of Africa CBC and the setup of the um, the Bureau of Heads of State to discuss this, which was chaired by Selva Ramaphosa, has been completely instrumental in actually a successful continental response. So I think it's a stage of where failure and success have been bedfellows. Um, Alan, I wonder if you could comment on um, how multilateral um, efforts or perhaps multilateral actors can help enhance international cooperation. Like I said earlier, we've seen lots of statements from them, you know, but um, countries and member states don't often or don't, don't always follow kind of the rules. Um, so I don't know what else can, uh, what other multilateral efforts can we do to perhaps encourage better um, international cooperation or regional? I think as rightfully said by Anna, there are a number of Commonwealth uh, countries that have the ability to manufacture vaccines. And I think the biggest tension uh, that has been in this COVID response has been around the ability to respect the uh, common treaty known as TRIPS, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement. And basically what that agreement says is that during times of emergency, you can waive some of your intellectual property rights for the sake of humanity and for the sake of public good to be able to ensure you address the challenge and then sort out the intellectual issues later because the very reason why TRIPS was created was to try and protect people's intellectual capability. But during emergencies, it was acknowledged that that needs to be waived because there's a greater good to saving lives uh, than safeguarding your own uh, intellectual uh, rights. And so I think that's where the tension stands in terms of the fact that there are a number of high income countries, some who are Commonwealth members that have been on record not being ready to allow for 
technology transfer, knowledge transfer that would allow other countries that may have the ability, for instance, South Africa, uh, uh, to be able to set up and be able to manufacture vaccines based on the technology or the knowledge that has been transferred. And I think that's a growing tension that needs to be addressed. And though there have been efforts where Gavi, WHO, Global Fund, UNDP, and others have come together to put up together the COVAX facility that is allowing countries to pledge and try to pull for vaccines to be able to get to lower uh, middle-income countries and elsewhere, that's not extremely sufficient because sometimes it's counterproductive for a country to be on one side not to push for technology transfer, but on the other hand, you're pumping money into the COVAX facility. It's it doesn't yeah. sort of resonate. You really need to go all out because as Ted Ross has said and many have said everywhere, you can't sort out the pandemic in Britain and think that you're safe. It'll still catch up with you because you're a global village. We all have to interact, we all have to travel. And even the thoughts around people trying to suggest that we should have vaccine passports doesn't make sense because if the vaccines are not easily available to everyone, adding a passport is adding to the inequality. And so I think those are the areas where, and I think I saw a letter by former heads of states to the president of the US asking him to think through how they can ensure that uh, we have the manufacturing companies that are doing the vaccines to be able to transfer this technology because many of them have actually got it funded by taxpayers' money to be able to do some of that research. And so it's only fair that if we really want to ensure we control this epidemic, uh, political leaders must stand in solidarity. They must step aside from the fact that we want to put profits first, we need to put people's lives first. And this actually is something that can be done in the Commonwealth. It would be a great statement if all Commonwealth health leaders came together towards pushing for people's vaccine, and that would definitely elevate and move things faster in terms of addressing the COVID response that is actually getting out of hand every minute we delay to get someone vaccinated. Thank you, Alan. Um, Talon, can I ask you just very quickly then a little bit more about how do we incentivize countries and I know ultimately the big businesses in those countries um, to uh, uh, agree to the TRIPS waiver. You know, we've seen countries, of, of course, so where I'm based, like in the UK, which is part of the Commonwealth, who've, um, who, who haven't agreed. Um, so what, yeah, how do you think we can incentivize them? So, for example, if you talk to them about kind of the right to health, do you think that's sufficient to be able to, to incentivize them? Or do we just need to talk about, you know, the, 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 how it will impact them specifically, um, you know, in terms of health and, the, and their economy in the long run if we don't get this, these, this sorts of pandemics under control? Just any thoughts on how do we incentivize them? So I have very clear thoughts on the idea of incentivizing governments um, and member states that already have certain obligations and responsibilities very set out for them clearly, right, by the different human rights um, treaties and, and um, resolutions that are ratified. Uh, but if you just think about the fact that even essential medicines is reflecting the sustainable development goals, what, what else do people need, right? But it's, it's, it's about transparency um, and accountability. And I think there is a space here for Commonwealth members and the foundation itself to remind private companies and pharmaceuticals to discharge their responsibilities, including exercise uh, human rights due diligence um, guided and, and set out in the guiding principles on business and human rights. That is already there. So it's about pushing internally and doing the advocacy and, and creating the space for civil society to do that because in many countries around the world, um, civil society and human rights defenders are being imprisoned and punished because of their activism. So it's about understanding that you particularly um, hold a certain power, right, as the foundation and how do you use that power? Um, and, and I think that's really what's important. And, and I mean, of course, it's a matter of ethics and basic humanity. We have been so dehumanized as, as, as Black people, as people of African descent, as people of the global um, South, that even in the midst of the worst global pandemic in our lifetime, we must still be thinking about how, in, how to incentivize pharmaceutical companies. And really, this issue shouldn't be an, an, an uncomplic a complicated matter. But the issue of ethics in this context of the global system of governance 
is also predicated on deeply unequal hierarchies yeah. on who's, who's more human and who's worthy of human rights. And so to discuss these issues of ethics and, and um, what else can be, do, can be done to entice the pharmaceutical companies is to bring into question the ethics of the systems we have participated in up until now, where we've normalized that other people in the global North everything must go well, they must get all the access, and it's okay if they hold on to the science. It's okay if they don't support temporary waivers, right? And yet we know that their economies are established on extraction, on minerals, mm -hmm. on people from the African continent to enrich themselves. And it's a historic trauma that lives on and on and on. So for me as a black person sitting here, I'm thinking what else do I need to do to show up for my humanity, that we must still think of incentivizing people to do right in terms of the global community, but also human rights. We have a social contract with each other and it's about accountability more than incentives. But I hear you and, and, I, and, and, and I perhaps there's a different question from wherever we are all positioned, but it really does boil down to accountability and the fact that people know they can do wrong yeah. and they can violate rights yeah. and nothing will happen to them. They know that. Yeah. And they've never even apologized for previous atrocities. So why, why would yeah. they now suddenly find clarity with COVID-19? Yeah. And I think what's even more disturbing than that, rather even other than just being the governments who, you know, don't fill their social contracts for this, but it, it, most of them are, um, they have the goal in mind is the next uh, election cycle, you know, and and then um, and actually, unfortunately, in times like these, we're seeing, you know, populations being more interested in kind of national interests as opposed to kind of global interest, which, which is a real shame. We've had a few questions. I'm going to go now to some questions from the audience um, and a few more questions related to the TRIPS waiver. So I'm just going to read them and see if um, they, they are, the, they've been answered some of these questions. So the first question is, what do the panelists think of the call for an emergency trips waiver in the context of the massive state aid provided for the creation of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines and the need to vaccinate as many people as fast as possible to enable more countries to be able to ramp up vaccine production? Um, and then the, se the second question on, on the TRIPS waiver, so we can just cover it at the same time, is what can Commonwealth countries do to ensure this proposal is adopted and to ensure that pharma companies um, share their technology and know-how? Um, so I don't know, who would like to answer that question? Uh, I'll give it a try, and I think with the first question, that's exactly what needs to happen like yesterday in terms of we must put TRIPS aside under the... Uh, we must put and utilize the TRIPS agreement in terms of the elements around uh, this is a public health emergency. And I think as Tedros has said before, if you cannot treat COVID as a public health emergency, I don't know what other public health emergency the world will be waiting for in order to activate the provisions of TRIPS. It's now or never. And I do agree the question posed, we definitely have to move that forward. How do we do it? Uh, there are conversations going to be happening soon at the WHO. We need to see Commonwealth countries stepping up in those conversations. Uh, to support the requests that have been earlier made by South Africa and India and supported by many other low middle income countries to allow for the waiver of the TRIPS uh, provisions and allow for the transfer of technologies. And then coming back to the countries, including the UK, that already have private pharmaceutical companies that have the ability to be able to develop some of these vaccines and uh, have the technologies, we need to see them leading by examples, by reaching out to other Commonwealth countries in other jurisdictions that have the capacity to be able to transfer the technology, transfer the knowledge and provide the support that is needed to help improve local production. We have greatly relied on India, but we all know what's going on in India now and quite rightfully so they are saying, we have to sort ourselves out before we start sorting the rest of the world. And so when are we going to learn to make as many other countries be at the level at which India is to be able to have more vaccines, more medicines, more pharmaceutical products being developed? So I think for me, the Commonwealth countries that are engaging in conversation with the WHO and the World Trade Organization within the umbrella of the COVAX facility, they need to show solidarity and they need to stand up for the people within the Commonwealth to enable that we're able to succeed in ensuring that people get, especially those who are in dire need of vaccine because of their vulnerability, get it as soon as possible. And we try to do our best to conquer this pandemic. Over. 
What are some lessons um, from a the AIDS and HIV then? Because, you know, previously we've had TRIPS waivers and, and it was very much, of course, um, due to uh, the civil society organisation sort of campaigning and activism and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, why did that work then? How long did it take to work and why hasn't it, I guess, worked now? Is the world just too different? I, I don't know. Anna, would you like to answer that question? I can add on to that. And it's actually a great example that is brought up very often in terms of a, a real example of um, civil society mobilizing, having an impact on government. So I completely agree with what Alan is saying that this waiver of um, trips protection should have happened yesterday. It should have happened months ago when vaccines became available. But it is not only about uh, sort of encouraging and waiting for governments to get together and really put forward these positions. As citizens, we also have a role to play, and that is to put pressure on governments to keep them accountable, to make sure, especially as citizens of countries where these vaccines were trialed, right, where all of these different um, uh, testing happened, to really make sure that uh, if this were to happen again, that we have a framework in place to ensure that we also have access to the products that we're helping produce. And part of this is also looking at COVID-19, but also building towards the future. This isn't going to be the last pandemic. How do we build this capacity? How do we strengthen um, the not only technological capacity, but supporting the technical know-how in the countries. We have experts, fantastic experts, fantastic universities, but many times the lack of funding is a main drawback for them being able to develop these vaccines and, and work on these things. So I think uh, we need to work concurrently both to um, address the current uh, scarcity in, in terms of access to vaccines and products, but also look towards the future and begin the investment now. So I think the momentum is now when it's fresh in our minds. Obviously, we have very short memories. And if we wait a year or two, people will forget what the pandemic felt like. So um, I'd encourage everyone to reach out to their fellow politicians, to their uh, constituencies, and, and really try to make action happen. Absolutely. So it's our duty to. Um, I've got one more question um, before we go on to the, the final theme, uh, and that is how can the international community harness this emergency? I think I know you were talking about that, some of that now already. How can they harness this emergency to improve the way uh, global health programmes are organised and funded, both to address long standing problems of health inequality and insecurity and to prepare for, for future pandemics. So I, I guess a, a follow up to kind of what Anna was already mentioning. I think we'll go to um, Kitenji. Yeah, you know, the, as I said earlier, um, government need to learn, but also the international system needs to learn. And I think if we look back to what happened to the Ebola crisis, there was so much activity around protecting the global economy you know, um, billions and uh, trillions of dollars went to that control. But as soon as, uh, you know, priorities moved on, the world moved on. And that's the reason why. If you look at a recent study on vaccine hesitancy, it is lowest across the continent in Congo, DR Congo. Why? Because mm -hmm. the people of DR Congo lost faith in the system, not only the national system, but the global system as well. Because if you only come in when we have Ebola, what about when everything else is happening? You know, what is our responsibility of our children dying of cholera, of our children dying of malaria, or is it only Ebola? In which case then, for those individuals in their minds, they have actually redefined global health security for them. That global health security is not global unless it is involving the development partners. So that is their mindset which they have refined. So we must also uh, change um, uh, this mindset about what is international cooperation? As, as President Kagame said recently, he said, the vaccine iniquity has shown that iniquity cannot be resolved through goodwill alone. It is critical that we realize that, that expecting the international cooperation and goodwill to actually resolve the global health security issues that we have, including this pandemic and the next one, is to fool ourselves. What then do we need to do? The international cooperation, the international community needs to realize that unless all of us are safe, none of us is safe. And therefore we need to invest jointly in international health regulations 
not as a national responsibility, but a global responsibility that not a, a poor country cannot be left to look after its international health regulations and say, oh, that one has been so poorly, let's wait. Because when the outbreak comes and comes from that particular country, as we have seen with Ebola, then we start running and we spend trillions of dollars. So I think it is time um, that also we start looking at security at a national level, security at a continental level, and I'm fully in support of the Africa agenda for vaccine manufacturing in the continent, which has been taken up by the African Union. The question is, will the Commonwealth countries and other development partners of the African Union, of, of Af the African continent, support the Africa vaccine manufacturing plan for not only for this pandemic, but for future pandemics? The final point is integration, that we cannot continue to deal with verticalization. We have to actually look at how do we integrate the global health architecture into a common health rights agenda, which is based on human capital, not HIV and AIDS, not uh, you know, TB only, malaria only, and maternal. How do we do a human capital approach and a health rights approach to our international cooperation? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, we've got to move on to our, our final theme, um, which is the role of the Commonwealth. And I know we've touched a little bit about um, some of this um, earlier, but with a bit more focus on the role of the Commonwealth, how can um, we leverage kind of the, the Commonwealth and, and that uh, relationship uh, in order to protect the right to health more? You know, how can it be the Commonwealth be a stronger force in protecting and promoting our right to health? Um, so yeah, maybe I'll start with Fleming. Um, so yeah, I do have some ideas and I think um, the Commonwealth, um, you know, has, has signed and um, worked on many declarations in the past, in the beginning, and now, you know, in what is, we know is the modern Commonwealth and then the foundation, but look back at these, right, past and present. Um, and firstly, and mostly hold this, the members of the Commonwealth accountable. Um, and I think that's what's really important. Um, and I think it has to be very clear that we are focusing on human rights, not charity. The time of charity is gone. Um, mm -hmm. You know, charity comes when people can and when they can't, they can't. But there's a certain um, expectation um, that is required and expected when you are using human rights frameworks. And I think it's important um, to create, an, a, 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 to at least foster the use of intersectional frameworks as a means of achieving substantive equality. Um, I think it's very, very important. I think, I think we've threaded through very well to show how all of these uh, problems like Ebola, like um, how, again, Africa has often left isolated and neglected when, when they need the, the global solidarity the most. Um, we need to really look at what is the root cause right and i think the foundation is best placed because you aim to assist and promote civic participation and the mm. only way that civic participation can be enhanced is by promoting access to information because that is what would enable the populations in the different regions of the world be able to then take decisions and hold the the different um, states and governments accountable for what they have promised and I think it's also important to put uh, money, right, to resource these plans. Because one thing about the health and the global health community, we can plan. But in terms of resourcing and spending, a lot of maladministration, a lot of corruption happens in the health sector. And whether it's philanthropic aid, whether it's aid and grants and charity by the foundation, it doesn't matter where the money is coming from. It never yields the desired outcomes. And that's why there's a lot of secrecy. That's why even now, even in civil society in South Africa is pushing back on this idea of non-disclosure agreements that pharmaceutical companies are making governments to sign. How will the civil society hold them accountable? if they are signing non disclosure agreements. In South Africa already, I can tell you, we didn't learn anything from the HIV uh, uh, um, epidemic and the response. There's been already a court case that I enjoined and submitted an expert affidavit as the UN Special Rapporteur precisely to allow the government to do 
and do what's right by people in terms of health equity and the vaccine. So it tells you we didn't learn anything because even the last time the government had to be taken to court yeah. to roll out you know, the, 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 the HIV uh, and, and do health systems training. So I think there's a lot about the secrecy and the maladministration and the corruption. Um, and there's a lot there, I think, that can be harnessed um, in terms of supporting and assisting civil society, but protecting human rights defenders, because also there's a silence, right? Um, and as UN experts, we can do all sorts of interventions, but if civil society doesn't pick it up to advocate where they are, um, they just remain statements. So it's about how do you actually coordinate all of the different human rights mechanisms, all of the different human rights defense um, processes to actually amplify, but at the end of the day, to defend the rights of the human rights defenders and ultimately, um, um, you know, and beyond, of course, um, look at issues of, of health equity, but we have to be intersectional with whatever plan we're coming up with. Thank you, Talani. I just wanted to go to Alan, because Alan, I know you have to leave a bit earlier. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to give any final comments or uh, your own thoughts on that question before you leave. I'm really Otherwise, it was to wonderful have to having... go to another commitment when this conversation is really getting quite interesting. But I think I'll sort of give my reflections as I conclude. And uh, just to say, the COVID pandemic provides an opportunity for countries to get it right with regards to fixing their health systems and all the other underlying issues that come to support the health system. And if countries in the Commonwealth do not start charting a correct pathway that involves putting people at the center of the response, being more transparent in how they are running their health system, being more participatory, being more accountable, and being more able to invest in their own health system, then I think we'll be taking a turn for the worst when we get out of this COVID pandemic. And so it is important that Commonwealth countries see this as an opportunity to get it right and to try and treat the right to health and other socioeconomic rights as very important rights. As Dr. Gidinji earlier mentioned, the tension between civil and political rights and social economic rights is quite fundamental. We have seen some Commonwealth countries that have managed to carry out elections during a pandemic, but we are still seeing the same countries are unable to provide oxygen for patients in their hospitals. So how is an election so important that you do not want to treat people? So I think we have to get the Commonwealth countries to rethink what they're doing. And I think the foundation is doing a great thing to support civil society and other players to play the role of transparency and accountability through giving grants, through supporting such conversations. I think that's something that how you have to do. And I think given that you have access to a number of heads of states, I think opening up spaces for those affected, affected communities, those frontline healthcare workers, I think we need to get them into some of the spaces that you are able to get them to converse with heads of states, uh, to share experiences and to be able to be persuasive in the way we can convince our leaders to take the right step. But I take it in stride that this is the turning moment for us on matters right to health, and we have no option but to get it right for the sake of humanity. I thank you all for listening, and I wish you well in the rest of the conversations. Looking forward to watching the remainder of the part that I will not be part of. Thank you, colleagues, and thank you, everyone, for being on. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Anna, I'd like to go to you with, with the same question. Um, so, yeah, what can the Commonwealth do to kind of protect and promote the right to health? Right. I think there are several approaches to take with this. Obviously, the Commonwealth itself, um, they already have signed a number of agreements and uh, declarations related to COVID-19, but really putting them into practice not only within the country, then trying to address those inequities within countries, but also bringing them to the international level of the World Health um, Assembly, especially where these issues are discussed, and where you can really mobilize uh, more global action. I think there is also um, an opportunity for the individual Commonwealth countries to hold other governments accountable. The, interesting thing about the Commonwealth is that members are also also belong to other groupings and other 
conversations. And so really harnessing and bringing that, that uh, viewpoint from the Commonwealth um, to other conversations like the G7, G20, really being the standard bearers for health um, as a human right. And then finally, of course, we've already mentioned the role of civil society, but also the citizenry and really um, trying to hold accountable the governments to these commitments. It might be lovely words on a piece of paper, but are actions actually being implemented? Are we seeing change? Are we seeing uh, real forceful uh, negotiations taking place from these governments at the global level? So those would be um, sort of the different approaches, but then obviously I've already mentioned trying to partner with other uh, groupings of countries uh, that are outside of the Commonwealth really harnessing those. So there are different uh, regional organizations, obviously. Everyone knows about the European Union, but I think there's a lot of strength in coming together with other countries in the global south as well. So looking at ASEAN or uh, African Union, obviously, and, and many Latin American countries who are all together in blocks as well. It's interesting you mentioned the European Union. You know, some people might argue that um, uh, the the kind of the, the their their role in um, acquiring vaccines and distributing vaccines across Europe has not been it's not it's, I would say it's too early to say not been a success story but it has been difficult and then and because of that we've already seen some kind of bilateral negotiations with kind of uh, governments like Germany to get acquire their own vaccines because as a union it has failed in some aspects or it was too slow um, uh, I don't know what do you think. How do you think that will reflect in, in in the future? Like, do you think that will um, have an impact or, or maybe in other regions as well? Uh, do you think that that sort of, do you see it as negative? Like there's obviously been other positive um, uh, uh, examples that we can give with regards to the European Union as well, but how do you see that playing out and how do you think it will affect um, the future outcomes as well? I completely agree. The European Union themselves have said that their response has been too slow and uh, they, they haven't been doing enough. And I think, the interesting thing and, and something to learn for Commonwealth countries as well is that regional organizations and groupings of countries are only as strong as their member states, right? These are mm -hmm. um, individual sort of actors that exist in a void. They're actually responsive and have to be responsive to their member states. And so if we see, and as we saw pre-pandemic, countries that are turning very nationalistic, that don't want to collaborate, that don't want to work under these regional norms, then we see the weakening of the institutions and that results in these effects that we see now, um, lack of preparedness, lack of solidarity. So while the European Union has tried to harness this um, solidarity, it hasn't been as strong as it could have been because at the same time, you see countries going their own way and doing their own things. Um, I mentioned the European Union because obviously it's the grouping that more, more people are familiar with but we see a lot of success stories in regional organizations in the global south, which is my particular interest. Um, very uh, tangible changes in terms of uh, improving access uh, of healthcare workers, stopping the brain drain of healthcare workers even before the pandemic, and very explicit actions related to Ebola as well, um, the Ebola pandemic, and ASEAN, which was very strong in terms of being able to stop SARS from spreading to the rest of the world. Obviously, a few countries did get it. So there are some success stories and we know collaboration works. We just need to invest in collaboration as well and prioritize collaboration. Uh, and obviously that's very difficult um, to put in practice because obviously governments are also accountable to their citizens. And so it's also about striking that balance. Okay, fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, so um, first question is uh, to Tla Leng. Um, how can we pr protect rights to healthcare for communities that are isolated from hospitals or clinics and reach communities in areas where modern transport systems are non-existent, like in Papi Papua New Guinea? And that's from Gabriel um, Karawi. It's very difficult. Um, and it really points to the fact that really no health system was properly prepared for this pandemic um, and the response needed to be immediate but the tools in which we needed to respond required time to build and so the infrastructure 
um, literal physical roads um, is, a, is a big, big problem. And many people, you know, we often talk about um, that the impact is even yet to be properly quantified. Um, because if you are far from a health facility and um, you are unable to access care, do we really know how many communities have been infected, indigenous communities have been infected because there is no one even on an ordinary basis taking the time to make sure that the infrastructure exists so that there is seamless movement between systems. The other problem that often exists is that there is this demonizing, right, of health, of, of indigenous health and traditional health practitioners. And yet many communities depend on those very practitioners when the westernized medicine fails to reach them. And so I still think that instead of having two parallel health systems where one is demonized and the one is seen to be the answer to everything, we need to have a, 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 a sit down and think about how do we get to a point where there is seamless referrals, there's respect on either side, um, and we actually respect the, the, the right for people to seek holistic care that takes their spirituality um, and, and, and mental health needs into account. Because a lot of the times it's not, um, it's, it's, it's not a physical road infrastructure um, obstacle, but it's also an obstacle just in terms of values and, and what, you know, how, how the system treats you. And, and so I think it's, it's important to talk about that. And it's unfortunate that in the time of a pandemic of a disaster, um, infrastructure that has been lagging behind and the investment in infrastructure can't just catch up overnight. Um, yeah. And this is why we, we, we call on strengthening of community health systems, because again, we, we have moved, right, in this very biomedical manner um, where everything is either being located within secondary or tertiary hospitals and neglecting community healthcare workers and community health. And I think that's one way um, of ensuring that communities that are far removed from the urban and peri centers does not necessarily mean they are being uh, left out of care. You should be able to live in a rural area and still access care. So those things are not um, in competition or in contradiction. In fact, if I had a choice, I would go back to my rural town of Kwakwa and not be a migrant worker in Johannesburg, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there, there's a whole discussion to be had about lack of opportunity. Why do we move from our towns and villages and rural areas? Is because we are seeking something better. But why is that mm -hmm. not there? Why is it not located? where we are yeah. um, and, yeah. and so those are the bigger discussions and it's unfortunate that at the time of a pandemic um, you know as much as we say that the health resources get diverted from one end of the health system to another like in SRHR where we've seen a, a huge um, neglect in terms of services in SRHR to COVID related responses and we can understand that but we can also speak about the lack of societal or civic support we, even during under lockdown, people don't have savings. We heard how companies, multi-billion dollar companies saying, no, we can't close for three months. We won't make it, we won't have money, but we're expecting individual people who are plowing the land to be able to survive a three month lockdown without any governmental support. And those are the structural obstacles and that go beyond just the geography and the physical geography, but also that manifest itself in many other ways as well. I was going to say, did you see in the, the news yesterday that in New Zealand they announced that they're going to um, set up a, a Maori um, health authority um, for the specifically for the Maori people that takes into account, you know, their culture and their specific health needs. Health needs. And when I first saw that in the news, I thought, why is this just being organised now? <laughs> yeah, and how is this the prime minister of New Zealand? In many ways, I think many countries can learn. Um, yeah. But yeah, they they at least they are starting. They're starting. You have to yeah. start. Um, yeah. We have to start from somewhere and we hope this pandemic is a trigger for, for much more, um, many more um, ish, uh, initiatives like that. And um, we'll just take a, another couple of um, questions. Uh, so how can civil society take proper action to convince governments to publish the reality of situations as they have rights to receive clear information? And uh, you, a couple of you have mentioned that already. Uh, and that comes from... Uh, 
Khandika Riaz Hussein from Bangladesh um, and influence and also another person that had influenced decisions to see that governments prioritize the health of their citizens as well. And that came from uh, an audience member from, from Uganda. So who, who would like to answer that question? I, I can pick a bit of that, Ines, and I, I think that this is really the power. And I think there's one of, one of the panelists here who said, government report to their people. Everyone has a boss and uh, the boss of government is the citizens. Um, the government do not report to the UN system. They don't report to Commonwealth. They don't report to Africa Union. That is peer-to-peer -peer accountability and institutionalization of, of, of kind of peer-to-peer -peer relationships. But accountability, which is in real sense, answerability only comes from the people. So for civil society to actually participate at your asking, we have to strengthen civil society structures. And it's, I think it's telling say that we need to give people information. Because once you give people information, then they're able to use that information to question accountability and to question governance. Number mm -hmm. two is to include people in governance itself. We've seen, for example, in health, that people don't generally get involved in, in, in the governance of healthcare. In fact, if you look at the systems many governments are using for planning, it is the good old health system building blocks of WHO, which has six building blocks, which are all supply side, assuming that people are just recipients of health services. They are not participants or producers of health. So reforming and putting people at the center and adding people as the most critical building block of a health system and all the others as supportive would be one step. The next one means that then you have to invoke people in the governance structure. We've seen countries like Iran, Tunisia, Thailand, and uh, France establish social participation structures, institutionalized, where people actually participate in what they call national health assemblies, all the way from the ground up. Of course, they are not optimal. Of course, the people's voices are not always obeyed, but that's a start. You know, as you say, there's a start. So we need to see information to the people, people involved in governance, an institutionalization of civic participation, not as a token, but institutionalized in the constitutions of the countries. Fantastic. We'll take um, uh, another question from, uh, how can we protect rights to healthcare for communities that are isolated um, uh, from hospitals or clinic? Oh no, we've read that question already. Apologies. Take a question. Um, the donor and humanitarian actors are mostly into construction of infrastructures with less attention to human resources for health. How we all know structures without skilled personnel within primary healthcare services cannot be delivered as desired. How can we improve on the situation that has direct bearing on the health of citizens at the grassroots level? And that comes from Musa Waziri from Nigeria. It's interesting that we brought up um, the donor community. Uh, Anna, would you like to answer that? Yes, uh, I completely agree that, um, and it goes back to this conversation we had earlier uh, about the vertical approach, right? We're trying to invest in very um, simple, direct uh, diseases in some cases, or building roads and building hospitals, but we're not really thinking about the human capital, the infrastructure beyond the physical buildings and really building that capacity within countries. And what we know is that this is, these are things that um, persist over time. You train one person and they can train another five people. And so it just makes good common sense to be able to invest in that. And I think um, what we've seen is since HIV AIDS and the huge investment that we had in the 2000s for HIV AIDS and for other vertical disease programs like tuberculosis and malaria, um, donors uh, know that they should be investing in strengthening health systems. They've signed a bunch of declarations. The Paris Declaration is the most famous one of them, saying that they're going to have accountability, that they're going to follow national plans, et cetera, et cetera. But in practice, we still see that for donors, it's much easier to just invest in one thing um, instead of because they want to be able to go in and out of countries um, and be able to show results. So I think what needs to really happen, and of course, this is. Um, the difficulty in a lot of low and middle income countries is being able to put limits 
and be an active participant into how these funds are invested and making sure that they are in line with the priorities in the country. That maybe in one country, cholera is a much wider, uh, causes more disease burden than let's say malaria, for example. So a lot of that is um, having the governments who are strong enough and, and uh, have that power and agency to be able to uh, you know, talk to donors, but then also um, as citizens electing uh, people that we can also hold accountable, people who are, have the transparency, trying to um, limit corruption. Corruption uh, is really, uh, healthcare is the sector that has the most corruption and this, uh, the, the literature shows us that. So how can we limit corruption as much as possible? Not only, and it's not only a phenomenon that happens in poor countries, also high income countries have a great degree, degree of corruption. So making sure that we are holding people accountable, but also having a conversation with the donors, making sure that they're actually investing in the needs of the countries. Okay, fantastic. We'll have one very quick last question and then we're going to have to wrap up. Um, and I'm really sad for, that we have to wrap up, but I know we'll have other things to do. Um, so Charling, just a very last question and it kind of talks to a little bit what Anna had just mentioned is, do you think someone asks, uh, you see from Landa from Henry from Nigeria asks, do you think that funds meant to co combat COVID-19 given to states were, were properly utilised? And I know Anna, you partly mentioned that, but I don't know, it'd be nice to hear if there was a good example um, to end the session. <laughs> Goodness, um, it's hard um, to, to think of, of, of one and just because of where I'm located, um, of course, receiving all of the, of the different feedback from the different areas in the world, but also living in a um, developing, you know, low middle income country. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, despite the numerous failures that we have highlighted today, there are still opportunities that lie ahead of us. And I think if we pay attention to the work um, that's been done towards building better systems by those who, whose lives depend on it, I think that's the one way that we can, that we can go ahead. Um, and, and as a global community, we have to commit to the democratization of global health architecture as a whole, because a lot of the funding, a lot of the policy, a lot of pragmatic work gets decided outside of the places without the people whose lives those depend on. And I think that's one way of moving forward. Um, and, and it's by being anti-racist in how we approach our work. Um, it's very important to understand that even the issues of vaccine hesitancy in many communities, um, it goes beyond just good governance by governments. It actually goes into a literal lived experience and a memory, right, um, of, of unethical and experimental um, medical practices that has happened into onto certain populations. And so I think there must be a way um, that we can express in policy and practice in resource allocation and, and spending um, that in fact, we want intersectional frameworks to be the backbone of public health. Um, and, and all of us must be guided by human rights principles. We cannot negotiate on human rights principles. We cannot beg. Um, these are not issues of charity. And I think it's important that societies ask their own government the very fundamental issue, why is it often the, the important healthcare programs that are related to our autonomy and bodily integrity and dignity are always shafted to charity and awaiting yeah. some form of donation and philanthropy. So there is light, <laughs> um, it's not the oncoming uh, train, I hope, um, but it, it is a moment that demands of all of us um, to really be committed to those very basic principles set out in the, in the Declaration of Human Rights, uh, but also in particularly on the right to health. Um, and I remain accessible and able and where I can um, to support, um, you know, different colleagues in the different um, areas of the world where, where we are working to really make sure that these principles come to life. On, on that note, um, on that wonderful note, I'm 
I'm afraid we're going to have to end this session. And for me, there's been so many things. I honestly could talk to you guys uh, all day. <laughs> um, but um, for me, like some of the big lessons that I've learned is that the definition on the right to health is, is still not clear. Um, inequity, a big lesson is inequity can't be solved through goodwill. You know, we need new legislation. We need countries and states and everybody to be truly accountable or answerable as Katenji mentioned um, and also um, incentive uh, for health you know health as a right is not a charity as Sterling told us so many times um, it is uh, it's a right uh, and and actually what I the most I think enlightening um, or uh, empowering statement that all of you have mentioned, Dana, all, Alan, all of you have mentioned, is that um, we, um, as civil society, we do have um, the opportunity, and if we pull together, we can influence our governments um, to be accountable and, and, and to, um, to collaborate and to kind of really see change. We know that our governments worry about the next election cycle, so let's, you know, get empower ourselves and, and vote in the right people. Um, so um, on that note, I would just like to once again thank you, all of you, for sparing your time. I know how busy you all are, um, and thank Thank all of the audience members who listened in and sent through all the questions on behalf of the Commonwealth Foundation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.